Hello and welcome to News in Depth. My name is Fabi Sakala. A hospice was a place where end-of-life care was given to those who needed it. The death rates were also high. But today about 80% of patients recover. In today's edition of News in Depth, Efim Pande tries to establish whether the role of hospices has changed over the years. The hospice is a relatively new concept in Zambia's healthcare system. It came as an answer to the crippling effects of AIDS and other terminal effects illnesses. Suddenly, the country had a disease on its hands that left patients bedridden and incapacitated. The incurable element of the virus and its inevitable ability to waste away a body called for a new line of approach. Hospitals were not enough. No wonder they were overwhelmed and their bed space overrun by an army of patients afflicted by the virus. Something had to be done away from the conventional healthcare services. And the answer was the hospice. The hospice as we know it today became more pronounced in the 1990s and with it came palliative care. Palliative care simply means any method used to alleviate pain or anxiety, especially in terminal illness. This in itself explains what hospices are all about. They are not about curing patients, but helping them to be comfortable and dignified in their illness. However, with the advancement of new drugs that have curtailed the ruthless onslaught of the virus, more people seem to be walking out of the hospice than before. Deaths are fewer and far apart. Today, a string of hospices run across the country, though many of these are run by churches. But is the hospice today the same as it was then? This is Sister K. O'Neill. She's a former administrator at Our Lady Hospice in Lusaka. I caught up with her to find out whether the role of a hospice has changed over the years. Yes, it has, from the point of view that in the early 90s, when uh, the hospices started to be built um, there was a great need at that time because there were no ARVs and the treatment for um, people suffering from HIV was very minimal and um, people were being discharged from the general hospitals because they were taking uh, up too much bed space in a very weak state and many of them uh, died maybe even on their way home and when they went home although home-based care did a, a wonderful job at that time helping people in their homes there was still need to provide a place to give quality uh, end-of-life care to patients who were suffering from HIV and in the 1990s and early 2000s, some of these hospices were started. And uh, in the earlier days, when this place was opened, um, very few patients went home after being admitted. Um, most of them died. But now, about 80% of the patients who are admitted here with opportunistic diseases, they're treated, they recover, they go home. So things have changed. So he goes on to say, you know. Dr. Joseph Kasonde has been in the health sector for many years, and he recalls how things were in those days. As you will recall, the 
original idea, if we could call it an original idea in the early 60s of um, a hospice, was really where you took people who were extremely ill, were not likely to recover, and they needed some uh, support in their last days. And so because of that uh, intention and image, um, those who were inclined to be helpful to the uh, sufferers who were seeing their last days did the same in many countries. Uh, uh, in our own country, the same thing happened. A number of institutions were built for that purpose as hospices. Now, what is important to recognize is that the support for creating those hospices was very much from outside the country. It was not as if the nation, the, the new nation, was raising money to build hospices, but supporters of the sick from across the world the Western world particularly, were keen to be helpful and they expressed their caring of the sick through the creation of hospices and they supported them. Mother of Mercy in Chilanga is one of the first hospices established in 1997. In those days, many never left the hospice alive. At the beginning, uh, the admissions were quite high number uh, in the rate of uh, 50, 500, around 500 per year annually. But the rate of uh, deaths was also very high. 50-60% uh, of patients that time were dying in the hospice. So mainly it was uh, hospice care for terminally ill patients the care at the end of the life. But within these many years, the, especially when the ARV drugs became available to the people, we also started uh, distribution of ARV drugs in 2006. We opened ARRT clinic in Chilanga, in the premises of the hospice. And the situation has changed. The admission, uh, the admissions are less annually, I can say half, about 250 approximately. And uh, also the rate of deaths decreased uh, to 20, 30 percent. So ARV drugs make a, a good progress and is a great help to the patients. And uh, even if we receive very sick patients, critically ill, sometimes with CD4, 3, 5, we are able even to help that the patient is becoming better and improving, improving quality of life and is discharged and going home. What has really changed? Is a hospice now an extension of the hospital? Many of those that were regarded as incurable became curable or at least were able to live for a long time and not just the few weeks that the hospices were anticipating. Uh, and so, really they were an extension of the service provided in the hospital, except that they were looked after in a hospice. They were not really terminal, they were not going immediately. Um, uh, and so they were part of a hospital bed. Uh, but because these facilities were there, they were kept there. And in some cases, the, the relatives were more comfortable to do that than to keep them in hospitals. So the role changed. There was another category of people who were really um, in an institution because the family were not able to keep them outside the institution. Here, they were not talking of terminal illness. They were talking of illnesses that could not be controlled, um, uh, especially if they had a mental character to them as well, uh, but who could not be looked after by their families, uh, whether they are nuclear or extended. So here we began to have a three-level 
hospice as of the last few years. Level one, those who are actually an extension of a serious hospital who should be treating a serious illness. Level two, those who shouldn't be in hospital, but the home to which they should be going is unable or unwilling to look after them. So they are looked after in this place of kind people. And the third group continued to be that level of the people who really genuinely uh, were in their last days of uh, life and needed to be looked after with dignity in a place which they called and call a hospice. Most of the financial support for hospices was from donors, but they too had their own problems. And slowly their support began to dwindle. Within a short time, hospices were facing financial crisis. Many began to close. 2012 was a difficult year for hospices. In January 2012, the mother of Mercy closed its admission wards. In June, John Hospice in Lusaka's Kamala Township closed. Today, the hospice has remained closed. In December 2012, Our Lady Hospice in Kalingalinga closed its admission wards. These closures caught the public eye and there was an outcry. The government acted quickly. A decision was made and a year later, the government started giving grants to hospices. In June 2013, Mother of Mercy Hospice reopened its admission wards. But the grant was only a temporary <coughs> measure. A lasting solution is yet to be found. This donor gave money for one year and it currently finished in May, so is no any longer supporting us. So 14 people still, we need to look for money. So it is a big challenge at the moment and we really don't know how long we manage to continue our services. Uh, this is my really big worry. And uh, I don't know, maybe for four or five months with the money which we have, we can continue, but we are still at risk of closure again or to change to another services, I don't know. We are just thinking, discussing what will be the way forward in future. At the moment, we are struggling, but we are offering services, and we hope that it will be long and as long as we can. Aaron from Mapepe area came to see his wife, who is admitted to Mother of Mercy Hospice. But things are different for Joseph Longo. Visitors are rare. He has been confined to a hospice bed for a year now. And during the last 12 months, very few people have been to see him. <coughs> the news about the pending closure of the hospice has revived old fears. In 2006, the Mother of Mercy Hospice opened the ART clinic. Two years later, the hospice started providing ART mobile services. And Shantumbu is one of the areas that have these services. We have clients who are on the art, so we bring medicine to the, our clients who are on the art. We normally do this program every after two months. The other challenge that we are still facing in this area is the stigma and discrimination and also the issue of culture and tradition. So as the hospice, we have the program that we want to intensify, like in awareness program, so that maybe we can raise awareness on the voluntary counseling and testing. ART mobile clinic is helping because people are not coming there and uh, 
some who are here who are very sick and they, they don't have the means of coming to to hospice so we follow them and they, they are benefiting because uh, even adherence is now good because we follow them where they stay so those who used to to, to, to refuse to come to take medication now they are adhering now and they are they are doing fine they are about to cross I mean the, 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 the donors are, are crossing now those donors who are funding our hospice so we don't know where we are going now because we are being told that maybe in October maybe they are crossing so we don't know what will happen when they will cross. Fanwa Ochafwa and his wife Dokas are from Shiala village in Chieftainess and Komesha's area and today we are among those receiving services from the ART mobile clinic. The couple was diagnosed with HIV six years ago. At the moment they are feeling fine and able to go about their farming activities. We spoke to them at their home afterwards. <laughs> Alimu watasole ya kusola, tulombabi ya kuboma, watasole. Alimu boma tuwa ilu mba, inta mungi ya weza ya kutegwa iti. Kai tulete la misamu kuma hospice kwa iso hoko. Kawa taliba boma, suno tulamba, no nenga nyewe muhi, anyewe, anyewe nenga tamundi hipepe. Ino boma ya katia ni, ya, ya, ya tupa musamu ulabo wala kwa hospice huko. Kwa kulumba, kutu ilu mba boma, kutu hospice wa ijala, suwebo ino nkuli huida. Ayo maka ni ingatu yumi na pakuti. Tatuchi nshi mbulibu yumi wakayena mbulibu tulimo. This may be the last time the hospice is coming to offer ART mobile clinic in Shantumbu. On the other hand, our lady hospice only reopened its admission wards on 14th July this year. But this time, with more rooms to put on high cost to keep the hospice running. Before it closed its admission wards in 2012, the hospice only had three rooms on high cost, but now there are 12. What? Sister Emanuela Mwansa takes us to some of the renovated rooms. These are tough times, but what other ways is management trying to keep the hospice running? Some other ways that we have um, thought of is to improve our training center where we do appeal to the public to come and uh, have their workshops there in order to support us because then we charge when they come and have their conferences in, in the training center. And also we have a guest house, a beautiful guest house, quite comfortable and self-contained that uh, people can come and use. You know, people think the hospice is just for dying people, but here we are really, we have diverse uh, services that we offer. Even physiotherapy, uh, people can come and uh, have their uh, physio uh, services done here at our physiotherapy department. The incinerator is one way that uh, we can generate some funds especially from the private clinics and hospitals, because we have a very good generator which we installed this year from South Africa, and it is working very well, and it can handle quite a good bit of uh, uh, hospital waste. So we are appealing to the clinics out there who would like to dispose of their clinical uh, waste to come to Our Lady's Hospice, we can charge them. Some patients prefer to be in a hospice because of one thing, palliative care. Hospices have been providing palliative care from the time they were established. What is the importance of palliative care? Its importance is that it can relieve hospitals from the congestion. Most of our patients, I would say yes, most of our patients are, not all of them, though. most of them are sick from illnesses that won't get better. So when you look at things like cancer in the last stages, you look at AIDS in the last stages, those people, you find them at the hospitals and filling up bed spaces. You think about palliative care and hospices, people can be taken there and be taken care of until their last days. 
Their mission statement is provide holistic care based on Christian faith to people living with HIV and AIDS and cancer. But a long-term solution on how hospices can mobilize resources is yet to be found. There's a, an increase in um, patients being diagnosed with cancer. Maybe in the past the patients died without being diagnosed, but now that we've got the cancer hospital and uh, more medical personnel even in, in the rural areas, there are many more patients being diagnosed. And there's need for a place like this for people, maybe while they're getting their treatment at the cancer hospital to have respite care here, and also, again, for end-of-life care. I would like to express gratitude to everyone who is with us, and, uh, as I said, individuals, companies, uh, organizations, uh, and, of course, uh, to Minister of Health, to Church's Health Association of Zambia, Lafarge, our neighbor, who also was supporting us during a difficult time and still is supporting us in different ways. To all well-wishers, to everyone, it's difficult to mention everyone, but to say thank you for being with us and because of you, of these people, well-wishers, organizations, we could continue and we can still continue and we still need you. So we hope that uh, maybe even more well-wishers or organizations can join us and come on the board and to help us that we will not close again the hospice. What is important is for us to be very clear. Who is it we are supporting? If you are ill, you should be in a hospital for treatment. If you are not ill and you need some supervision of some kind, you should be in your home or in the community. And the people who justifiably should be seen as requiring and in need of hospice care, government should intervene and ensure that they're comfortable. The problem is in mobilizing resources. The solution to this division has still not been found. So you are, you are mobilizing resources for a number of people who, for whom it would, should not have been necessary. I think that hospice, by its history and um, image, always has a donor philanthropic element. And I think that it would really be impossible to distinguish between a hospice that is totally a government agency as opposed to one that is supported by the people, by the community, by the donors and so forth. Because they're in really intertwined. By definition, there should be support from the community because it's the community that is deciding that these people should be looked after in that way. It is clear that the role of hospices has changed over the years. But the challenge on mobilizing resources locally is far from being won. Well, that's all we had for you on the program. I've been your presenter, Febi Sakala, saying goodbye and God bless.